Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to change this very quickly to see for you. Here we go. For our second conversation here with Stacy Levy this evening, um, entitled How Art Works working with nature and people. That is slightly different than the opening slide that we had for you there. But we are so excited to have you join us. For those of you who didn't join us last week, I'll give you a little background on our amazing speaker, Stacy. Uh, Stacy Levy is an artist who works with rain, urban tides and watersheds. Her projects give a home to rain on many sites from parking lots to nature centers. Her installations on tidal rivers give people a sense of amplitude and timing of tide in cities. She also works to make visible how watersheds are the capillaries of the land carrying precious rainwater from sky to sea. She has created temporary and permanent works in Philadelphia, New York, Seattle, Phoenix, Tampa, Miami, San Antonio, and Fayetteville, um, Arkansas. She often collaborates with engineers, ecologists, and landscape architects to make artwork that helps solve simple site issues like stormwater runoff, water pollution, and stream bank erosion. She's a graduate of Yale University, majoring in art and forestry, and she got her MFA from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. We are so excited to have Stacy join us here again, and last week's conversation was absolutely a joy to be part of and to hear from her, and with that, I will pass it off to Stacy to begin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, is the screen sharing nicely? Can you see yes. everything? Okay, excellent. Everything is all good. And are you recording? Yes, we are recording. Okay. We, we, I forgot that in the beginning of something and it was uh, quite something to try and get it all back again. So um, thank you everyone. Thanks for coming to the second lecture. I'm hoping that except for this slide, there should be no duplicates of visuals in this, um, in this lecture. I'm looking at a completely different body of work and a uh, different way of looking at things. Um, and yes, I did change the title slightly to Nature and Humans. Um, oftentimes these things change, but it's uh, the idea is that we're gonna look at artworks that are collaborative and are working both with the collaboration between artists, ecologists and engineers, but also collaborative between humans and nature too. So um, we'll get started in just a moment. I just wanna give, um, a little uh, a sense of where where I am situated. I'm on the stolen lands of the Susquehannock who are no longer here and haven't been walking in these territories for a very long time, pretty much since about 50 to 100 years after European settlement. That was uh, the Susquehannocks moved down towards Tennessee. And um, then the land was taken over by German and Scottish settlers who were pretty much here today. Um, the watershed that I'm in, it leads into the Susquehanna and which leads into the Chesapeake Bay. So even though I'm three and a half hours from the Chesapeake Bay, if I put a stick in my local creek, it would float all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay. And I think it would take about two weeks for it to do that. So um, so we'll, we'll begin. Um, and of course, this never wants to change. Uh, one of the things that's to be remembered is that we definitely have a very heavy relationship with technology. Though sometimes we say we're just good friends, I'd say it's a little more serious than that. But we also haven't really investigated technology and what, what it does and what it's made us do. Um, and there's a history of uh, feeding on the extraction of resources of the domination of water. I was just hearing about how we um, engineered the Chicago River to flow the opposite direction because we needed we needed a solution. Um, and there's a great deal of uh, negligence of our own industrial waste that we're creating. And, and I'm included in that. I create a great deal of industrial waste just by being an American. Our mythology of technology, and that's really what it is. We really have a mythos around the importance of technology. But in, within that, we're, we're finding ourselves in a broken relationship with nature. And I feel that we may be in a time where it's, it's really high time to try another strategy, um, something that changes our relationship to nature because we're drowning in information, but we're starving for wisdom, which is a wonderful quote from Julia Watson, who's writing about indigenous architecture and the knowledge that we lose 
when we only consider new technology as the way to live with the world. So I often think about what would happen if we did strengthen our relationship with nature, if we really looked at nature to be the guide for what we do. And what if we used art as the way to repair that very connection that has been broken? Instead of using science as our repair technique, what happens if we take art and use it for repair? Um, and we make artful places to understand nature. Much That was much about last week's lecture was all about how art is a very great tool to translate ecology. Um, and this week we're gonna be talking about how art can capture the powers of nature, the ecological processes of the site that are passing through the site that are part of the site and harness these ecological processes in ways that actually solve the site issues, site issues like stormwater runoff and water pollution, also habitat destruction and, um, and erosion. So I'm looking into ways that art can embrace change and both observe and mimic the, through biomimicry the action of natural processes. Can I replicate and expand on those natural processes on a site to begin to make real changes to the environment? Um, and it is to be remembered that engineering has had a rather long run as the, the major uh, solution maker, the problem solver to our issues as we live on this earth. Um, we've used engineering as our go-to solution for solving almost every site issue, and it's not always done such a wonderful job. And I hope if there are engineers and out in that audience that we will talk about how important it is to open up this field and think about including art in it and think about how engineering doesn't always work hard enough to restore our relationship with nature. And maybe it's time for engineering to reach out to art. As an artist, I certainly reach out to engineers and I love working with engineers. Um, and I think it's fairly mutual because we really are both incredibly curious about how the world works. We wanna figure out solutions and we like to um, have a beautiful solution that's in sync with the situation. So artists and engineers are kind of a natural combination in a similar way that artists and scientists are a natural combination. So um, I'm really thinking that in this time of climate crisis, it's truly time to get more collaborative and to collaborate with civil engineers and artists slash engineers, because in many ways, I'm actually a sort of unlicensed and a little bit dangerous, perhaps engineer out there. I'm engineering situations. I'm looking at natural processes and trying to apply biomimicry to them and trying to create working solutions to site issues that we face in every time they build a CVS and put a parking lot outside of it. So it is important to know that our crisis of climate change is not going to be solved by technology alone, even though we sort of want the magic pill and everyone thinks that if we you know, change the color of clouds or, or spray more water in the air, somehow we'll have a solution there, but our solution is gonna come from a lot of different points and it's not gonna be purely technological. So let's look at ways that art and engineering can start to address some of the issues that we're going to be living with due to climate crisis and see how uh, art and engineering collaborating can solve some um, site issues. Because I really think it's time to start practicing how we want the world to be now. We can't keep waiting. We can't keep holding it arm's length. It's time to start experimenting, to start collaborating and to start getting out of our silos and getting the disciplines together so that we can solve these problems that are seeming a tad insolvable at this point. It's very important to remember that art needs to be a strategy, not an accessory. I am not a piece of jewelry on the site. I am not parsley around the pig of the project. I'm not a garnish. My art can be highly functional and it can bring functionality to the site in a way that's very um, evocative to people and acceptable to people too, which is not always the case with some ugly engineering. 
So um, this idea of creating solutions is a very new role for art. Art for many years was the way I was told to differentiate art from craft was if art had no function. Well, I'm really ready to throw that out because I don't think it's been helpful for art to be a functionless, sort of armless, um, unable to make any changes in this world kind of situation. I think that is um, something very old and we need to get rid of it. It's time for the idea that art can be part of the solution. And we're going to have a lot of things that need to have solutions. With climate crisis, we're going to get far more extremes, much more rain in the East Coast um, at more of a frequency and more of an intensity. So in any given rainstorm, more rain is going to fall out of the sky in a half hour period than ever has happened before. Now there's gonna be a great deal of drought in other places. Places that could tend towards drought are going to go droughty. Places that tend towards having more water are gonna get very, very wet. And I happen to be in one of those wet zones. So that's something that I'm dealing with. Um, all of the rain that falls on our lawns and our parking lots and our roofs, all the impervious materials, the materials that will not soak up water, flows directly down to our local streams. This happens in dry areas and in wet areas. And all of that water pouring into the stream all at the same time overwhelms the streams with too much water. It's like a you know, it's feast and famine. And when the feast happens, there's too much water introduced too quickly and it scours out the banks. Here you can see these bare banks with the roots sticking out. The roots are trying desperately to hold the bank together. And that scouring is a terrible thing for the streams to go through. So one very important job of engineers and of artists is to keep the water out of the streams, out from flowing directly into the streams via the surface. Water should be flowing into streams via groundwater. It should be coming seeping in the sides of streams. Um, when nature is intact, the rain has a time and place to soak in. This is something that's missing in most suburban and urban areas. That rain is not given neither time nor space. It needs both of them. So we need to think a little bit more about what the rain needs and design for the rain. Um, oftentimes we have monocultures of worthless lawn. And I say worthless because lawns support very few species. They, they do a little bit of, um, I think the um, Japanese beetles do pretty well in a lawn. And about 70 to 80% of the water that falls from the sky rolls right off the lawn. So it's just about the same as having a piece of carpet outside. Um, so this landscape of lawn has nothing to offer to the world, except it needs to be mowed, which then creates more of a carbon footprint. So how can we start to think about these little spaces where um, water really needs to infiltrate and create conveyance and infiltration and to create green infrastructure that prevents that rain that's falling out of the sky from rolling across the lawns and the and the parking lots and right into the local creeks where it scours out the banks and kills all the microorganisms. So this is a project at the Springside School in Philadelphia which takes the precipitation coming from the sky, conveys it through this kind of watershedy looking um, gutter situation, which is simply eye-catching and tells people as they pass by at 40 miles an hour on the road nearby that something is happening here. But the real workhorse of this project is the infiltration that's happening in the green areas on the, on the soil surface. Um, I'm creating a lot more biodiversity by creating a rain garden here. And I'm giving a lot more space to the rain and I'm giving something sort of delightful for those 40 mile an hour views of the passing cars. Yes, there's a great deal less space for people because it used to all be open to people because it was lawn and lawn says, oh, you can walk anywhere. Now you can only sort of stand on or sit on the um, terrace that's been created. It's a smaller space, but it's a much more intriguing and welcoming space. We don't need acres of, of lawn when we can do little terraces of um, comfortable spaces where you can watch the species, um, different flowers, different pollinators coming forth. Um, everyone in the school, it's a K through 12 school, was um, part of the planting. Um, and here we are planting the river of iris. 
And here it is um, about two seasons later, a river virus with banks of asters, everything very carefully planted for it's where it likes to have wetter or not so wet feet. Um, I'm very inspired by industrial infrastructure. I think pipes are really cool. And so I was very happy to use some off the shelf materials to create this watershed. Um, the pipes take on a new residence. They, and this time they're reminding us of the watershed and the form of the watershed and that not connection between just the roof and the drain, but the idea that the rain and the watershed and the streams that it runs through are all connected also. So this idea that we're sharing our real estate with rain is very important and something we haven't been particularly good at. We have a lot of hardscapes in our cities and our suburbs, but hardscapes live very badly with rain. Our feet stay a little bit drier, there's no mud, but um, it is not a good, it's not a good surface for rain to be absorbed by. There's no absorption in the city. It all goes down drains and into pipes, usually in older cities, sewer pipes, and then gets poured out into creeks or, or rivers or directly into the ocean. Um, we often think that coastal flooding is going to be our sort of, is what makes us most nervous about climate crisis. It's the coastal cities indeed will flood as sea levels rise, as temperatures rise. Um, but we're also going to have that additional rain that's going to come with very erratic weather patterns. And we're going to get pluvial flooding, flooding from rain. That's pluvial from the um, Latin. That's the, anyone who took French or um, knows that that's plue is also the rain. So this, this pluvial flooding is going to happen more often because the frequency and intensity of rain is going to be much larger and greater, and that's all due to climate change. So this is something we have to contend with, and we're contending with right now. This is not the future. It's actually happening now. One of the reasons that Hurricane Sandy was so difficult in New York is because there was a great deal of pluvial flooding on top of a king tide. So the ocean was coming in, and the, the fresh water was trying to go out, and it really flooded the city very badly. So how can art really address this issue of rain having no place to go? Uh, one of the um, places that I've been able to help with conveyance and infiltration is at the Frick Environmental Center, which is part of a living building challenge. Those of you might be familiar with it. If you're not, living building challenge is, is like taking the lead list of being um, environmental and sustainable and making it into a truly meaningful uh, organism type thinking. Instead of it being a list, it's a system where anything that the building has to generate anything going in and has to also take care of anything going out. Basically nothing goes out. So everything is recycled and reused. It generates its own electricity and also it recycles its own water. So I'm part of this recycling of the water creating this sort of artful weir and taking rain from the roof and really celebrating the passage of water, allowing this beautiful natural resource, fresh water from the sky, very pure, except for a little acid rain that's in it, um, is, is coming down and is part of our environment. And typically we put it into a pipe so we'll never see it again. So instead of instead of hiding it, I'm making that rainwater have a real appearance and be something you can play in too. Now, it's very important to remember that this work requires collaboration with other disciplines. I do not do this alone as a lone artist. I'm working with landscape and building architects. I'm working very intensely with engineers. And I'm also working with ecologists to make this work. And also people who do academic or um, educational programming afterwards too. Um, and it's so important now that we start combining the knowledge of all these different disciplines. There's so many problems that we need solutions for, and we need to really get our heads together in a real way and take off the, the caps of our profession and share them and really start thinking about new solutions to these issues. With the Living Building Challenge, they, they have a nice formula, which is about the petals that each, that you have to hit each of these petals, water, equity, beauty, health, energy, materials, and um, sustainability. And the art here was able to, to um, and site, that's not sustainability. The um, art was able to actually be very effective in hitting two of these, hitting both water and beauty, 
um, and fulfilling that in the living building challenge, which is a, a serious thing to try and go for. They're not at this point, there are not that many buildings that have it, but they're starting to be more and more and people are getting better about it. And so let's see if this changes it. Understand. Oh, there we go. So um, with the Living Building Challenge, it gives art a very specific task to do. In this case, I needed to convey the water and make it evocative. And while I'm doing that, I need to make it In at times, it's I guess unless it was above your waist or something, and I also have to think about the in between times where it's just a little bit wet, but it's not actually raining or it's not pouring down. So, when I make these works, I have to think about them in these different guises, in these different conditions. Um, in this particular one, I also wanted to teach about the local uh, geology, and I created a kind of mnemonic, an abstraction of the pattern that you would see in the stream below. So when you see when you see that, it maybe sort of perks up your mind to look for that kind of pattern reiterated in a much more fine granuled situation of the actual delicate shale of the geology of this watershed. It's a beautiful forms, but easy to miss. So I'm trying to set you up for that and giving you a great place to play, particularly if you're, um, you know, bring your plastic dinosaurs out and pretend you're in a big canyon. Um, a place to be and a place to be when it rains. So in this uh, nature center, they actually have a draw for a rainy day. Most nature centers are sort of like, oh, too bad it's raining, got to go inside. Here, there's something you can go visit when it's raining. So this idea of art working to, si to solve um, site issues, a lot of my work has to do with infiltration because rain is such a big issue. And I do feel very strongly that buildings need to drink their own rainwater, whatever falls on their roofs and their parking lots and the sites that don't absorb the rain, those buildings need to become responsible for that water and not pass the buck downstream into the poor creek that is not prepared to have a deluge every time it rains. I think it's very important that environmental centers are the ones that lead the parade on this one because my feeling is if environmental centers themselves can't, can't do a good job being responsible to rain, can't drink their own rainwater, it's a little far-fetched to expect that anyone else is gonna follow suit. So it's very important for, for environmental centers to set the course and show us how to live with rain. Um, so I'm making a home for the rain here. This is the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education in Philadelphia. Um, I'm making a home for the rain. So from sky to ground, it has a place. Um, and one of the ways of thinking about this is turning the idea of the pipe kind of on its head. We tend to give people the entire space to run around in and the, the rain gets a little pipe to run through. Turn this on its head, give rain the lion's share of the space and the people get a smaller space, in this case, a sort of um, meandering form. It's much smaller than where they had to walk before, where they were able to walk before, but it's far more interesting. So this kind of bunk bed idea too, where the um, rain is, is going down through the porous um, surface. This is um, expanded metal that's been painted. Um, and the plants then can grow up through that to reach even more sun and to give us beautiful uh, uh, flowers. And our feet stay dry. So we have this bunk bed where the rain has the lower bunk, the flowers kind of go between and, um, and we're on the top bunk staying dry. Because rain, rain, when it hits the ground, it hits hard. It's like tiny little bombs every raindrop. And uh, rain is actually a major um, compactor of, of park soils if you don't have any vegetation or enough vegetation covering the ground. Um, there's a, a lot of damage that the soil, uh, at the soil has due to rain hitting it when there's no protection from um, vegetation. So unvegetated soils really get a punishment during a rainstorm. So if we're going to be truly responsible for rain, we need to um, give rain time, space, and vegetation too to cover the ground so it doesn't injure the ground 
Um, and that's the best way to make a home for the rain. But we got to really rethink this relationship. This rain coming out of the sky is fresh water. Fresh water is going to become extremely rare. And to treat this stuff like a toxic cocktail, a storm water that we're trying to drive off the site is very, very misguided. I mean, it would be like, I don't know if gold were falling out of the sky and we all threw it in the trash. Uh, there's something precious coming out of the sky. Let us celebrate it. Let us let it do what it needs to do and let us preserve it. So we really have to think about how we can have more equitably shared spaces for people and for plants. We're not the only species on this planet. We cannot act as if we are. And I think in acting th that we are the only species, we're becoming very lonesome. We're not working in consort with other species. And I think it's making us feel alienated and filled with anxiety. So bringing more species into where we live is one of the ways of living better with the earth and also will be happier. So these are highly engineered for filtration. These are serious um, green infrastructure with basins and depths that are all gonna take the, um, the 500 year storm, which might become like the, the 25 year storm at the rate we're moving. Um, and it's, very, it's carefully engineered for that time and that space um, for rain to infiltrate the soil. Um, and this whole idea that we've delineated the wet and the dry in almost everything we do, our shorelines are usually uh, concretized and you're, you're on the shore and it's dry or the water is flowing through. Most of water doesn't really flow that way. Most water doesn't say I'm entirely wet or I'm entirely dry. It's in an in-between state. It's in the soggy state. And we really need to embrace that the land needs to um, be open to sogginess. Um, here I am planting with my wonderful volunteers, um, diverse vegetation, all sorts of plants that enjoy and celebrate the soggy, that will flower in the soggy. And the rewards of, of, of supporting the sogginess are that you have a wonderful wetness diversity. Sometimes it's a little drier, sometimes it's, it's mucky as can be. You get a lot more beauty. This is far more beautiful than a lawn. And you get a system that works with the natural processes, not trying to ban it, trying to really do something with it. So um, it's also making wonderful spaces for people, outdoor classrooms where you can learn about nature, you can do all sorts of experiments, you're close to it, but you're not getting all that muddy. So it's a, it's a very nice way of being in nature. It's creating a porous platform for rain, for plants and for people. And porosity is something that welcomes the rain. It can flow through porosity. We need a lot more porosity, sponginess in all of our infrastructure. Because when we don't have porosity, we end up running the water off and into a waterway that does not want all of that extra water being, being directed, redirected into it. That is not natural. Um, it's also really important to think about how we need to celebrate rain. It's a pretty amazing thing that water comes out of the sky. And if you live in a droughty area, I was just talking to a friend from Tucson, they have had two inches of rain this year. They need 11 inches of rain. We get 11 inches of rain sometimes in a single rainstorm, but this, the desert relies on such a small amount, but sometimes isn't getting that. You'd see how precious water is. And the way we get water is from the sky in the form of rain. So we need to celebrate it, not to think of it as something bad. And the idea that art needs to help us celebrate it in every season. And in, um, you know, to, to really play the beauty of the seasons up through the artfulness of the piece. So hardscapes, um, sort of the bane of my existence. So I grew up in a city, so I'm quite familiar with them. They will hold on to a lot of water, but they do not allow infiltration. And infiltration is really important because it's part of cleaning the surfaces, the, the water that has touched and come in contact with these fairly filthy surfaces made filthy by our cars and our tires and um, the gas that comes out of our cars and the oil that drips out and the, the rubber that is sort of micro smeared onto the road. 
all of these materials that are fairly toxic are rolling right into our waterways. If we have a better infiltration system, those get absorbed by the soil and do not go into the waterways. So we really need to think about how we're filtering pollutants. The best done with planted buffer zones. Um, the riparian buffers, the buffers at the edges of rivers and streams are really important to make sure that all of those pollutants don't roll right into our streams. Um, the problem is in a lot of urban areas, people don't haven't really considered that buffers are part of the urban fabric. So how do we make more buffers and more infiltration in a very urban site? Um, here is a project where it's a, um, an old industrial site. Most of the buildings have been raised, but the, but the sort of foundation materials of concrete and the parking materials of asphalt have all been left. So I'm taking, I'm taking out of the book of biomimicry a way of solving uh, a situation. I've got lots and lots of hardscape. I notice that when people are trying to protect hardscape, they make sure that plants are not in it because plants will slowly start to allow moisture to go in and you get a freeze thaw process. So I'm going to imitate that or invite in that freeze thaw process because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I actually want to break the concrete apart slowly and so I'm going to borrow that process and make it active and make it visible. That's where oftentimes I'm different than an engineer. I, I activate, but I also make something highly vis visible and, and understandable from by people who are looking at it. So this freeze thaw allows the water to go into the cracks as, as, um, as precipitation and then it, if it freezes, it's going to expand the way water does when it becomes ice and create more cracking. So I'm doing this kind of, you know, trying to speed up the erosion of the site. Um, and I'm drawing the watershed here on these industrial leftovers, the hard shoulders of the, of the river. The river really wants to have soft buffering vegetative shoulders. And we often just put our parking lots right up to the edges of our rivers or um, just pave them because that's what we know what to do. And we also like the view directly into our rivers, but these hard shoulders are not what the river would request if the river, if we could listen to what the river wanted. Um, so I'm connecting these, these areas to the soil below so that things can infiltrate and then planting it by putting soil in and native species. So these shoulders are softening with more vegetation. It's not all vegetation because we couldn't a afford to move all of that, um, all of that hardscape that would have taken the entire budget. And also, um, people need to park here on occasion. About three times a year, they need to park and fill this parking lot up. And now they can just park over the plants. So here's a dendritic decay garden. Um, I'm decaying it with this dendritic pattern of the watershed. Three growing seasons later, it's important to remember that any kind of landscape-based thing never looks good on the first day it goes in, but gets better and better. Unlike architecture, which looks great the first day it goes in and looks worse and worse over time. So I'm creating an urban riparian buffer. This is a little hard to park over, but in the winter, most of these stems are broken down and um, you can just back right over a lot of them. This is the other part of the dendritic decay garden where we're repurposing broken up concrete. It's the first season. So we've broken up areas. Basically the concrete that was right here is now broken up. A little bit is used to create a wall and we plant it in between. So here it is growing in its first winter. And um, there it is in its third season filled with natives with butterfly um, bush and um, black-eyed Susan, and I can't remember what the white plant is, but I know it's native. But this idea of the sleep, creep, and leap, anyone who does perennial gardening knows that perennials really need three years. That first year, they're sleeping, hardly doing anything. Second year, get a little bit of action, but the third year is amazing. And here, you know, it's winter and there's so much more seasonal interest than the parking lot used to afford. But say if this was all lawn, it would look the same every single season, day in, day out, it's still a green lawn. But here we have the scruffy and the soggy. 
it's so much more interesting than the typical smooth and dry of concrete or just the simply smooth and damp of the lawn. So scruffy and soggy are two things that we should be aiming for. And the idea that we can make rain gardens in an urban setting, we can make swales, which are kind of like urban creeks in, in this new setting of the parking lot. We have to stop being so afraid of water hanging out in the landscape. Because rain needs time and space, parking lots have that to give rain. Now, there are issues with mosquitoes, you need, but you need a good 36 hours. So if the water is hanging out for 28 of those hours, that's going to be okay. And we have to get used to the idea that there will be places with giant puddles that then slowly infiltrate into the soil. And it's just to be remembered, this is not done by a lone artist, nor a lone landscape architect, nor a lone engineer. This is a team collaboration and everyone's, everyone's skill set was utilized, was stirred into the pot of making a project like this. Um, it really takes a lot of collaboration between disciplines, but also between nature and us, um, trying to bring nature in, in this case, through holes drilled in the concrete. Um, because it's even this very small park is a, a step towards learning to live with nature. And it's amazing to see when you see kids who just gravitate instantly towards puddles and anything green, you realize how important it is to live with even the smallest bit of nature is, is better than no nature at all. So many small changes are really important. Um, here's another project with solving a different ecological problem with art and biomimicry, holding hands. This is um, a water pollution issue. Uh, here we have a uh, chem lawn, which um, is creating a great deal of nitrogen pollution and phosphorus to, um, in attempting to make lawns green in people's backyards. And it, instead it's making um, any kind of lake that's near the backyard green. So the green lawn is, it still has dandelions in it and people are dissatisfied with their lawns, but it's making the lake substantially greener with all sorts of um, runoff bringing phosphorus and nitrogen into the, the lake and growing a great deal of algae. So how is art going to be part of a solution here? Um, one of the things I'm looking at is um, this idea of biomimicry of um, the wetland as a as a uh, infiltration process. Wetlands are very good at absorbing a lot of nutrients, um, usually on the edges of the water before it gets into the water, but also it's active if they're floating. So this idea of a floating wetland, which is a, a human-made structure, I mean, there are a few floating wetlands in, in nature, but very few. Um, they the the idea you can create more wetlands than what your edge allows. And if we think about it, the edge of waterways is often privately owned and we can't have control of it, but these can float out in the middle and clean the water, but they're not typically very visually evocative. So I was been thinking about how can I make a floating wetland that has some kind of beauty and meaning to it? And I grew up as an artist looking at the spiral jetty which is truly the Mona Lisa of earthworks. If you say you're an environmental artist, someone will put a picture of you next to the spiral jetty somehow. That's, so I had to really make peace with this, this project, which is a huge macho gesture in the lake. And um, I wanted to remake it as a sort of feminist statement that this could be a beautiful form, but a different kind of function. So it's now floating, it's plant filled instead of just rubble and it's habitat, it's a wetland habitat. And these floating wetlands work, um, the, I always thought it was more of the plants are taking up the nutrients, but it's actually the microorganisms, tiny cyanobacteria are absorbing the, the nutrients and they're living on the roots. So the roots are kind of more of a substrate than an action, but you gotta have them down there. So in this tangle of roots, all of these microorganisms are absorbing the phosphorus and nitrogen. And so the juncus suffusus, the native plant grows up with the foliage and down with the roots and creates this living, breathing artwork, real eco art, not land art from the seventies, which was really a bunch of guys making very large bulldozery gestures out in the wilderness. 
I have no interest in that. I don't need to carve the top off a mountain. To me, that's mountain topping. I want to figure out how to make art that lives with a system that is working and living and supporting other species. And these floating wetlands become amazing places for birds and fish and turtles. They're protected out here from feral cats, a huge issue with bird populations. And in the tangled shade underneath, a lot of fish are living. And it also is good for people too. It gives a destination in the lake for recreational boaters and fisher people love it because there's this shady spot where fish um, gather in, in the noonday sun. So this idea that art can help build for other species as well as ourselves is really an important precept, something that artists are certainly don't go to school to be trained to do, but I think it's a new way of looking at how art can function, that we can include other species. You can see the proportion of the spiral within this lake. It's the little green um, frond, sort of uh, the little green um, fern at the at the dam end of the lake. In order to truly treat this lake, we'd need 10 of these um, spiral wetlands. And I could not afford to put 10 in. So I'm introducing the idea so that it can be seen and understood and embraced. And in time, I hope that it will turn into that they'll put more of these in the lake when people see that it's effective. And we did do um, water testing with the biology department at the University of Arkansas. A guy was doing his master's degree, was working on this, and it did change the water around the, um, the spiral wetland. So this is a, an artful solution in collaboration with ecology. And let's crack me up that chickens sometimes want to make a spiral too. So it's very, to me, it's important to think about what happens when you sort of switch it around and stop working for people and start making nature of the client. And what happens when you put the site's needs, the ecological needs first, instead of sort of second, like, oh yeah, we gotta solve that too. When you stop saying, I must have this many cars parked in this parking lot and start saying, I must have this much infiltration in this parking lot. So if nature's your client, how do things change over time? And can you reconfigure the spaces according to what nature needs instead of according to what we need to, you know, what we think we need in terms of parking, which is almost always an overestimate, except maybe two times a year. So thinking about what nature needs and designing for that um, so that there's more sharing with nature. This is a simple proposal of, planting um, grasses in a sort of topographical um, uh, set of, of, of swales in a parking lot so that it catches, it catches a lot of the, the, nutri the um, pollution from the parking lot. So I do really think about how much we can change if we keep nature as our client. And it's very clarifying to have nature as your client when you're working on a project and you have to make decisions and you're making those decisions for your human client who indeed is paying the bill, writing the checks, nature doesn't write checks, but um, nature can take things back from you if you don't work well with it. So what happens when you, when you switch that around and you say, whatever decisions I make here, nature is the client and is gonna get sort of first dibs on, on what the natural processes need. I know that we would then enjoy a better, um, relationship with nature. That would be a huge benefit if we had nature as the client. Um, and also if nature was our client, it'd be a really different way of working interdisciplinarily to um, create these answers and we would all be on the same page about who was who needed to be served here. We've so long separated these disciplines of art and engineering, architecture and ecology. And this separation has denied us new solutions, new ways to create strategies to live better with nature. And we really need to employ these new solutions if we're going to be somewhat resilient in the face of climate crisis. So giving rain a home is a very, very important first step and art can be hand in hand with engineering and landscape architecture and building architecture can really help give rain a home and capture, you know, through the architecture and through the um, planting 
can capture rainwater. This is the um, Arboretum at Penn State where all the rainwater at the visitor center runs through a scupper and then runs through a map of the, um, of the watershed. Now this map doesn't infiltrate right at the stone part, but this is where weddings happen. So that's where they're, they're getting their revenue from that, but the edges are where it infiltrates. So we're building for nature's needs as well as bridal needs and sharing the wonders of the watershed with everyone who comes to visit this arboretum um, and adapting to uh, the variations that weather is gonna throw us. We always have it in, on the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest, there will always be wet as well as dry. And creating these places where we can actually live happily with rain, where it's not, you don't go, oh, it's raining, what a mess. Okay, maybe you can't wear blue suede shoes, but you can enjoy living with rain, watching it at work, watching it move through the landscape if you design the landscape to be a good home for the rain. So I really, I really urge anyone who's thinking about this to stick their neck out a little bit and experiment. We're not always absolutely certain it's gonna work, but if you use some good sense, you collaborate with people who know things, um, and can troubleshoot with you, such as engineers, you can often get really amazing, uh, very functional landscapes. And I think it's important to remember that you can't always have the answer because we create because we are possessed by our questions, not because we have the answer. We have to stick our necks out and try some new solutions or we're gonna be sunk. But our first, our first thing is to make nature our client. And I do feel that nature is watching us to see if we're going to learn anything in the next whatever time we have before the deluge comes. And um, we have to think about living more fairly with other species to truly be sharing the landscape that we have considered humans own property and always to support the living and the active ecology on the site. So thank you very much. And I'd love to take any questions that you have. Um, we, we have about 10 minutes or, oh no, we have more time than that. That's good, this took a little, little less than an hour. Um, and any questions you have about the idea of nature's our client and sharing with other species and just how these collaborations work, I'd be really interested in, in hearing what you have to say. So um, we can open that up to questions. Feel free to leave those in the chat. And we already have a few okay. going for you, Stacy. First is from Lisa King. She's the executive director of the Summit Metro Parks. What is the most common barrier for groups to get your ideas implemented? Sorry, what's the most common what? Barrier for groups oh. to get your ideas in, implemented. Um, uh, tradition. <laughs> it's, um, People who uh, are not comfortable with collaborating, who think that there's some kind of hierarchy to building, um, make it problematic. Uh, the, uh, the engineers and architects and landscape architects I work with have to be of a collaborative nature or else they feel like everyone's secondary and their ideas aren't that important. Um, buy in from the institution that is doing it uh, saying it's important and we're, this is what we're going to do and standing their ground, even if they lose a parking space or two, um, even if there's a, a moment of, of construction that was may have been unexpected. Um, that's important. But one of the great things is when this kind of artwork goes in, there's often so much buy-in because the artwork is uh, very embracing of people and also brings in other species that people enjoy watching from pollinators to bird species, um, that, that the, the engineering is far more accepted and even can be loved because the art is there working, um, working also. So uh, there's a certain need to take a risk because this work isn't always proven. It's not in engineering textbooks always, though much of it can be supported by engineering textbooks, um, not that much of it's been done. So there's sort of a risk-taking needs to be embraced too. Wonderful. Elisa also notes that we have a lot of decayed paved areas around here. 
and what a cool repurpose so much of your work would be. Great, yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, a lot of this work, you know, the, the maintenance becomes a big question people ask about what well, it's supposed to be maintained. But if you think about how much maintenance goes into keeping our hardscapes hard, um, nobody, nobody sort of questions that a road is being resurfaced or that someone's out there burning the weeds off of a concrete um, parking lot. Uh, if you get gardeners out who are weeding, they get questioned, what are you doing here? Is this taxpayer dollar? But it's interesting what we find acceptable maintenance and what we find that seems extraneous and extra. And I just feel that all the people who um, have been creating pavement will sort of switch around and create more porous pavement, learn how to make more swales in their work. And then other people can um, work more with planting instead of um, burning the weeds off the surface. Wonderful. Uh, the next question is from Marsha. She said, uh, what is the plant material for your version of the spiral Getty? She said she didn't catch that. Sorry about that. Oh, it's Juncus effusus. Um, that's common, common rush. Um, it's a native species. I, I did use, I, I sort of tipped my hat to a minimalist tradition. I only used one species because it was my first one. And I didn't want the complication of different growing um, sort of speeds and or having a failure of one plant and not another. So it's it is a monoculture, but it is a native um, that's growing all throughout in certain places where it's where it doesn't when the lawn isn't going right up to the edge of the lake. It's growing in the natural wetland areas. It's a very um, common wetland plant. And most wetland plants can be popped into these floating wetlands. Floating wetlands are used everywhere, almost on an industrial scale in Thailand and um, um, Australia and New Zealand. It, they tend to be where, where it's a little bit warmer if they're going to be treating sewage, but they're used in sewage treatment um, in, in a truly green infrastructure way, um, not just not on small scales at all. So I, I knew that this would have some real function. Another question from Karen. She says, I keep thinking what you did at the school with the rain gardens can be done on a smaller scale at people's homes. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend resources on how to do it at the home level? Um, probably your water department, your local water department has thought about this. Um, they're often, water departments are getting very savvy about the idea that everyone needs to help cut down on the amount of water that's flowing into the street and down the street and into the storm drain and then into the combined sewage outfall and right into a river. So everyone is um, responsible. So people who are um, keeping their water on their properties longer, even in terms of a rain barrel helps, but also people um, who are making their lawns have, or not their lawns, but their landscapes to not be lawn and to have better infiltration through um, just simply being another another kind of landscape. A, a meadow will absorb a lot more water than a lawn, which doesn't absorb very much at all. A forest, even a small backyard forest does a lot more to absorb the water. So simply changing the landscape is something we can do and then creating very intense um, swales of vegetation at before the water hits the street, if there is extra water or at the end of a driveway um, would be a good idea too. But water departments are getting savvy about this and, and water departments should be, their websites usually have a lot about what you can do in your own yard to keep the rain infiltrating and not rolling into the sewage system. Well, we have a question from Facebook from Abby Kerper. She asks, I was introduced to biomimicry at work through the university, through a University of Akron student. Yeah. It's such a powerful tool. This has been so interesting. Your ideas are wonderful. Will you be sharing your entire presentation? Oh, whoever wants to share it has go have at it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Uh, and then a question from Beth Vild. Uh, have you used mushrooms in your floating wetlands? I have not. I don't think mushrooms would be appropriate for a floating wetland um, because that uh, mushrooms need a, rich, a sort of more controlled terrestrial sogginess, not a full, fully wet situation. 
I haven't worked with mushrooms uh, much. I've worked with other funguses um, just in picturing them. And if you saw my my last talk, I had had a had a, a whole sort of set of things that pictured the 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 fungus in two portraits. So I'm fascinated by the forms of them. I'm fascinated by what mushrooms can do, but I have not worked directly with mushrooms yet. A lot of artists are working with mushrooms, which is really cool. And at some point, something will come along. But um, though they, we think about mushrooms and wetness, it isn't something that's good for a floating wetland. And, um, uh, but it is something that's good for a soggy landscape and one of the great benefits. Wonderful. Um, uh, Deb Yandala asks, environmental literacy is just as important as any other types of literacy. Can you suggest one or two or three concepts that you think are critical for every citizen of the planet to understand? Is this what we should think about in terms of general public education? Mm, I completely agree that environmental literacy is absolutely essential and we can do all the science in the world, but if nobody understands it and gets it, then it doesn't get absorbed or or dealt with. And climate crisis is a perfect example of that. I, It's been brewing. Uh, we've known that it's coming at us since the 50s. It's certainly when I was in forestry school, there was a lot of talk about it in the 80s. And yet it's not, It's besides it's been the study of it has been suppressed by, uh, concerns that are interested in pretending that there is no climate problem because of fossil fuels, um, people haven't really been able to get it. They haven't been able to understand it. And that lack of understanding has brought us to this place where we basically run out of time to make changes and we just can't pivot. And this understanding that we have to share the planet with other species and that's not a burden because if you share it well, then you can live there too. But if you share it badly, you can't live there for as long as you hope to, um, is a really important lesson. This lesson of sharing that we learn in kindergarten seems to evade us as we get older and we forget that we have to live on this planet with other species. And if we destroy the other species, we are slowly destroying our own prospects. So that's another lesson that's very important to learn. But working with natural processes instead of against it, I think that our bias of technology is that somehow it's free from nature. And if it, if it despoils nature or it condemns nature in any way or suppresses nature, that that's sort of okay because it's technology and technology is always right. We need to learn that technology is, is, can be a tool that can be used for us or against us. And we have to be very careful with our, our lust for technology. And one way to sort of mitigate that lust is to always design with natural processes in mind, with nature in mind. And if it works for the natural processes, then it's good technology. And if it works against it, then it's bad technology. Wonderful. Uh, we just had another question from Susan Danko. Have you ever considered rain gardens with edible plants? Um, no, I haven't. I, I'm um, edible plants. I'm just trying to think, well, there's certainly, there's the most wonderful rain gardens with edible plants would be cranberry bogs and blueberry bogs. So there is a great amount of edible berries that are created with wetness. There's not so much in the way of nuts that I can think of, but though you might wonder the way almonds and walnuts take up so many gallons of water per nut, you would think that they would do well in a soggy soil, um, but uh, the walnuts sort of do better. Um, I haven't made edible, um, edible landscapes for people. I've made edible landscapes for birds. Um, because I feel that people have um, have their own gardens that they can do that with, but people forget to plant the right things for birds. So I've I've been much more concerned about making sure that there's food sources um, for birds. And one of those mistakes that we've always made is we think that birds eat berries all the time, and we've forgotten 
that birds are absolutely reliant on caterpillars in the spring when they're procreating, when they're creating chicks and needing to feed chicks, they need to have this protein burst that they can only get through caterpillars. Berries, not, not much in the way of um, protein, all carbohydrate. So when we think about edible landscapes, we've often thought incorrectly about the things we like to eat, like we like berries, but of course, the idea that we're not eating insects, we're not growing steak on trees. Um, it's very important to be thinking about the full cycle of animals and what they need to be edible out there. Um, and so I really think we should put more focus on what animals, particularly birds need to eat rather than worrying so much about what we'd like to eat. Um, I think along our streets and where people where people are going a lot, that's a nice idea to have edible landscapes and, and to have permaculture along with street trees. Um, but it's difficult too um, because edible landscapes require a certain amount of maintenance to keep them good for eating. And that kind of maintenance is sometimes above and beyond what people are able to do. So I, I, have, I have mixed feelings about trying to add an edible component into, um, into these already slightly difficult to, uh, to get into the picture landscape. So, but um, I think everyone should have, you know, as much edibleness on median strips and backyards and on curbs as possible. Maybe not so much in the rain gardens, unless you have a huge one and you can do a cranberry bog. And to close us out, I have a wonderful question from our very own Nicole Mullet. How did your childhood send you down this path of environmental art? Well, I, I was very lucky growing up. I grew up right on the edge of a huge park, Fairmount Park, which is actually the world's largest park if you count all the parts, pieces of it um, in Philadelphia. And because I was always on the edge of a fairly, what looked to me to be a wild woods I was always very comfortable in nature and um, I like to crawl around um, in among branches on, and um, down in streams in particular. And uh, it, I, I think in, in one of my bios, it talks about how when I was little, I played a lot in the waterways of that park. And after rainstorms, my God, the water would just be, you know, would be up a couple of feet in the, in the stream and it was great to sail sticks down it and just play with it and damn it but it always smelled a little funny it smelled sort of like you know like a bathroom and it was later that I made the connection that I was playing in in um basically sewage outfall <laughs> when I was little um didn't didn't hurt me none but um so I think that that was a really important thing to realize I thought that water was beautiful and wondrous. And it was, it was basically the, the rainwater coming off the streets, combining and overflowing the sewage systems and having to sort of pour out into the, into the streams. Um, and so I thought hmm, maybe that's, that water is wonderful and it should be turned into something that we can really celebrate. Well, this was great, Stacy. Oh my goodness. I like want you to do like a tour of Summit County and tell us what we should do with various areas. Right. I'm sure we all have I'm someone. <laughs> well, we all have some place in the back of our mind right now. We're like, that could be so much better. Yeah. So yeah, well, collect them and we'll take a look at it when we, yeah. when we start <laughs> traveling great. again. Well, I must uh, thank our co-host for this event, the Akron Zoo, the city of Akron, the city of Cuyahoga Falls. The Conservancy for the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, Great Lakes Biomimicry, Summit Metro Parks, and the University of Akron Biomimicry and Innovation Center. They've been tremendous partners and we're lucky to have such great uh, environmental resources here in Summit County. And we invite you all to join us uh, next Wednesday as Stacy explores more of her methodology behind her work with the brass tacks of public art next Wednesday, starting at 4 p.m. So with that, we thank you all and we thank you, Stacy. This is just the best. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming and sharing this with me tonight. Okay. Bye, everyone.